I read about a survey that was taken recently by a group that was looking for the perfect pastor. Did I hear a groan? According to this study, the perfect pastor looks like this. Preaches a sermon in exactly 12 minutes. Often condemns sin, but never upsets anyone. Works from 8 in the morning till 10 at night. Serves as the church janitor and groundskeeper. Makes $100 a week. Wears nice clothes, buys good books, drives a nice car, and gives $50 a week to the church. Is 28 years old and has been preaching for 30 years. <laughs> Is wonderfully gentle and handsome. Gives of himself completely, but never gets too close to anyone, lest he be criticized for playing favorites. Speaks boldly on social issues, but never becomes politically involved. Has a burning desire to work with teenagers, and spends all of his time with the senior citizens. Makes 15 house calls daily to church members, visits the shut-ins and those in the hospital. Spends all of his time evangelizing the unchurched and is always in his office when needed. Well, folks, I have to, something to tell you here this morning. If you were hoping to get the perfect pastor, you got robbed. No, you got robbed. <laughs> it's probably safe to say there never was and there will never be a perfect pastor. Try as we might to find one. Try as we might to be one. Try as we might to produce one. It's an extinct animal, if you will. There is no perfect pastor. Boy, thank God for that. What a relief. And thank you for the fact that God continues to call me. God continues to qualify me. God continues to grow me as the pastor in this congregation, in this place, at this time. Thank God for your patience and your prayers as I continue to grow as a pastor. Truth is, there is no perfect pastor. And there's no perfect church either. Try as we might to find one, or be one, or produce one, that too is an extinct animal. It doesn't exist. Thank God for that. What a relief, huh? And yet, we worship a perfect God in this church. A God who continues to call you. A God who continues to qualify you. A God who continues to grow you that we might continue to grow as God's church in this place at this time. I thank God that you are here this morning. Thank you for coming. What a beautiful day. You could be anywhere. But you're here. God has brought you here this morning. And thank God for that. I hope in some way you feel God's presence in your life. That you will walk out of here equipped in some way to live the faith. And maybe come back next week. And maybe bring somebody with you. Our topic this morning is the word grow. And according to our reading this morning from Ephesians, the pastor's job is not to do the ministry, but to equip the saints to do ministry. To grow people into being disciples of Jesus. That's the job of all leaders in the church, according to Paul in Ephesians. 
Our reading this morning is the only place in the Bible, the only place in the Bible where the word pastor appears. It's very clear in that verse that the pastor is part of a team of leaders, of four other leaders in the church. Listen to these words again. The gifts God gave to the church were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. According to this Bible passage, leaders in the church are to equip the members to do the ministry, to build up the church, to empower people to grow in the unity of the faith and to become more like Jesus. You may have heard me say in the past, because I know I did this on the last series, that, that I encourage you to go and be Jesus to your neighbor. Do you remember me saying that? Everybody's head should be going this way. Yeah, you said that. I know I said it. And I've heard other pastors say it. But that's wrong. We aren't to go and be Jesus. We can't be Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus doesn't want us to be Him. There's only one Jesus. We are to be ourselves. To be ourselves and to realize that wherever we go, we're to take Jesus with us. That's doable. That's possible. The word maturity in this verse, and by the way, it only appears in the Bible in this verse, along with pastor. I'm not sure what pastor and maturity means going, we won't go there. That was a joke. <laughs> but the word maturity in this verse means to grow in becoming more like Jesus every day. And the only way for that to happen that I've realized is if we spend time with Jesus, following His examples. This is important stuff, folks, because if we get this wrong, we won't get anything right. Leaders in the church are to be equippers, not doers. And each person is responsible for their own faith maturity. That's what Paul's saying. I'm not making this up. Now, I've come to realize this is such a hard shift to make. This is not an easy shift to make. I struggle with this all the time. But what I've realized is we've done a flip-flop in the church. And we've got to flip it back again. We've created something that was never meant to be. We've created an environment where we pay the pastor or we pay other leaders to do the ministry on behalf of the people. When really the leaders are to help you do the ministry and grow as disciples of Christ. Do you know what the word liturgy means? Liturgy means the work of the people. That tells me something. According to the Bible, leadership in the church is measured less by what leaders accomplish and more by what leaders cause to happen in the lives of other people. That's huge. Let me say that again. Leadership in the church is measured less by what leaders accomplish and more by what leaders cause to happen in the lives of other people. Everything we do in the church ought to focus on creating an environment that equips people for ministry. It's a perfect model. This is so important. Because if we get this wrong, we won't get anything right. Unfortunately, this is not the model we use. 
And it's not the model that I was taught in seminary. I, I didn't discover or stumble upon this model until I was in the church, my first call, trying to do it all. It, it, it couldn't be done. I was taught to be a doer. I love to do. And it's hard to shift, to step back and let others do, to equip others. We don't use this model in the church. I wonder why. But more importantly, I wonder how we can recapture this perfect model for leadership in the church today. Now, I could be wrong on this. But it seems to me we've developed a codependency model in the church. A less than perfect model in the church. I, I looked up the word codependency on Wikipedia so you know it's got to be legitimate. Wikipedia says codependency is an unhealthy love and a tendency to behave in overly passive or excessively caretaking ways that harms one's relationship and quality of life. It also involves placing a lower priority on one's own needs while being excessively preoccupied with the needs of others. Codependency can occur in any type of relationship, including family, work, friendship, and also romantic, peer, or community relationships. I'm convinced we don't need codependent leaders in the church. We don't need one or two paid people to do the ministry on behalf of the congregation. We need leaders who help others do the ministry. Folks, I am so, so thankful for the many people who serve in this church and do the ministry that we are totally unaware of. The people who prepare communion week after week, coming and going and faithfully serving. The people who study and wrestle to be the best kind of facilitator in our life groups so that those who gather have a good experience. Those who serve in our sound booth, those who serve in the band, those who serve in the choir, those who even take care of the candles, those who serve as greeters and ushers, those who serve in our children's church. We have so many people serving in this church. It would make your head spin. I want to say thank you. Thank you for serving. You know what I think we need in the church? No, I know we need in the church. We need coaches. That's what we need. We need people who help others get in the game. It's very biblical. I love being an assistant coach on my children's baseball teams. Working with six, seven, eight, nine, ten year olds can be very challenging and very rewarding at the same time. You never know what's going to come out of their mouth. You never know what they're going to do. And yet it's amazing how they grow from week to week. It's exciting to see them improve. The biggest challenge in coaching children to play baseball, which is not an easy game to play, the biggest challenge is helping them stay focused. Oh, my word. In T-ball, coaches are out on the field with them, and they're all on the field. And it amazes me how easy these T-ball players get distracted. Here's what some have said to me. Hey, coach, my dad's taking us out for ice cream after the game. <laughs> hey, coach, is this the last batter? Hey, coach, what inning is this? I'm really hot. Can I go to the bathroom? I'm thirsty. Are we done yet? Oftentimes, they'll just walk off the field if they have to go to the bathroom or get a drink. They don't care. 
And yesterday, I laughed and laughed and laughed when one little boy said to me, Hey, is that my mom at the concession stand? I wonder what she's getting. <laughs> Helping these young children stay focused is a big part of coaching. When we started coaching these young children a month or so ago, they couldn't even hold a glove. They couldn't even throw a ball. So we had to teach them the basics. We had to teach them how to hold and throw the ball, how you turn and step and throw overhand, how to grip the ball, how to grip the bat, how to swing the bat, how to watch the ball hit the bat, how to not watch the ball after you hit it but run to first base. I mean, these are the basics that we need to teach these children so they can play. The thing about coaching is, I can't play the game for them. I can't throw the ball for them. I can't hit the ball for them. I can't field the ball for them. I can't run for them. I can yell at them. I'm pretty good at that. But what I love to do is encourage them, to equip them, to help them grow in the skill of playing the game. I really enjoy doing drills with my son Simon in our yard. We'll do grounders and fly balls, grounders and fly balls, not too long, not too short, but just enough. And I'm impressed with how he improves from week to week. And then when it's time for the game, like the other boys, they want to be in the game. And it's very obvious what children are doing drills during the week. And it shows in the game. Because they get better, they like the game more. And they constantly improve. It amazes me when we have some sitting on the bench. They don't want to be on the bench. They want to be in the game. One said to me yesterday, Coach, I don't want to sit here on the bench. There's no action here. Um, cheer. I mean, they don't want to be on the bench. They want to be in the game. It dawned on me that pastoring is a lot like coaching. One, pastors remind people of the basics. And two, pastors can't live the faith for you. That would be codependency. You have to do it yourself. A pastor teaches the basics and then continually reminds people of the basics again and again and again, just like in baseball. So here are the six basics here at Freedens. Pray daily. Spend time with God regularly. To worship weekly. God created us to be in community like this in large and small groups. Three, read the Bible regularly. It's God's playbook for our lives. Four, serve at and beyond Freedens. We're all gifted to serve, and there's a place for everyone according to our giftedness. Five, relate and encourage with one another in our spiritual growth. You are pastors to one another. Six, give of yourself using 10% as the guide. God has graciously given to us. And as we give, we are showing God's love to others. By practicing these basics, we grow. We get better. We improve. We build up the body of Christ. Now, I realize growth does not come naturally. You've got to practice, like juggling. You've got to practice. Practice, practice, practice. On the ball field, it's really easy to tell which players are practicing. It's really easy in the church to tell who's practicing. 
Christian life involves growth. And the Bible's clear on this. The goal isn't about being born again. It's about growing up. It's about growing up in the maturity of the faith and reflecting more and more the words, the thoughts, and the deeds of Jesus Christ. We are to grow up spiritually. So here are three things to remember. First, we're all responsible for our own spiritual growth. We're in this together to love one another, to care for one another, to encourage one another, to pastor to one another. But ultimately, each one of us is responsible for our own faith development. On the ball field, we say like this, you can do it. Second, growth is possible no matter how new or how long we've been on the team. Everyone has potential to grow. God desires that we grow, that we mature into the likeness of Christ Jesus. No one is left sitting on the bench in an effective church. We say it like this on the field, play your position and communicate with your teammates. Third, growth takes place best when we participate in the community, in both large and small group gatherings. We gather because this is where Jesus promises to meet us, like that balloon. Where'd it go? Floating around. Thank you, Mike. There. Just like that balloon. Christ is present here, floating among us. If one member is missing, then the team is incomplete. On the field, we say it like this, we're all on the same team, and everyone matters. Imagine, just imagine with me for a moment, if each one of us committed this week to taking a small step in growing into the likeness of Jesus, by practicing the faith, by showing just a little more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more kindness, more gentleness, more generosity, more self-control. We talked about those things last week. Imagine what would happen here in the Myerstown area if we all began to model that kind of growth in our own lives, in our families, in our neighborhoods. That's God's game plan for us. There is no need for anyone to be left sitting on the bench. There's no action there. We're here to grow. We're here to grow, and we grow best by being out on the field, out on the mission field. And the mission field starts at the front door of the church. So let's go. Let's grow. Amen. Let us pray.